Hello everyone and welcome to this podcast. Today I'm very excited. We've got our first transatlantic guest on the on the show. So um, welcome Sue. So Sue is a world-renowned physical therapist or physio if you're from the UK and also certified athletic trainer. She holds the distinction of being the first female head athletic trainer in any of the four major sports in the US, which is amazing, and served as head athletic training and support perform, sport performance with the US soccer men's team. So definitely interested in learning a bit more about Jürgen Klinsmann, who I presume you worked with over there. Um, Sue currently offers consultancy for a variety of elite organizations and athletes, as well as her company, Structure and Function Education. So an impressive CV. I know I've only covered a tiny bit of it, but firstly, welcome Sue. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, Richard is uh, my wiener dog, uh, my dachshund. Richard will be joining us for part of the morning. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who are watching this on video, then we are joined by Richard the dachshund. And also Sue is out in what is a lot warmer climate than we're in in uh, Manchester. So what's the temperature there, Sue? Uh, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona right now, and it is about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, so I don't know what that is about, maybe 20 degrees or so um, Celsius. We're still dipping into our 30 degree or 100 degree weather here and there, but uh, hopefully we've got triple digits behind us and we're kind of settling into Arizona fall, which is, like I said, about... 90 degrees during the day, maybe 25 degrees during the day, and about 20 degrees in the morning and at night. So still quite warm by your standards. Definitely, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. No, well, this <laughs> is, I've been wanting to sit down with you and talk with you for a long time. Your name's come up in loads of different avenues and areas from friends of mine. So I'm really pleased and thankful that you're able to join with us. And firstly, how did you get started in physical therapy? Um, you know, pretty much probably like a lot of physios kind of get started. I mean, I knew I wanted to do something in medicine. Um, I thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. That's sort of where I wanted to, to head. And so um, at the time, physio was a four-year degree here in, uh, in the States. And so um, I decided to do that instead of some type of a pre-med. And while I was in physio school, I just fell in love with it and just really enjoyed um, everything about it with the connections that you make with the patients and, uh, you know, the active uh, daily lifestyle in the clinic. And so I just never even bothered to apply to med school once I really learned what um, PT was and, and really enjoyed it. And then in the clinic, I used to work with um, an athletic trainer. And I don't think you guys have athletic trainers over in the UK. I think the equivalent would be like a sport therapist over there. Um, and athletic therapists or athletic trainers over here, they do uh, a variety of different things, but historically and typically had been known for kind of being the person that runs out onto the field. If there's an injury, they do a lot of acute care management and just a lot of um, uh, primary care, more a little bit more internal medicine type stuff as well. And so got into athletic training and sort of added that to my repertoire and sort of um, got into strength and conditioning at the same time, doing some personal training while in grad school. And then sort of really, once I kind of got done with my formal schooling, was really able to combine those three things of the physio, um, the sport therapist, and the, um, and the strength and conditioning into what might be, um, or at least what was back in the day, a fairly unique combination of, uh, of things. And so you say that you were looking at other avenues as well when you were doing that, but did you have any particular aspirations once you realized that physio was something that you loved doing? Like what did you have a vision of, of where you wanted to get to? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I just, I thought I was going to really enjoy outpatient orthopedics. I really had no vision of working in sports per se. Even once I went back to athletic training school, um, I thought, you know, maybe I would work in college athletics. Um, I certainly had no aspirations of working within professional sport. That just wasn't even, for no no particular reason, not that I didn't think I couldn't do it, just, just wasn't necessarily something beyond like my childhood dream of telling my mom I wanted to work for our American football team, the Buffalo Bills. Um, but, um, you know, 
I didn't think that, it, not that I couldn't do it. It just didn't even kind of cross my mind as something that was really sort of an avenue. So I thought maybe college athletics, um, but, um, but yeah, it kind of worked out into the way that it did. So is, is American football, would you say that was your main passion then? Yeah, you know, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, which is a lot closer to you guys than where I am right now. You know, obviously you guys probably know where the state of New York is. Buffalo is about two hours outside of Toronto. So I'm about 15 minutes from the Canadian border. So I'm quite west as far as um, New York State goes, like a good eight hour drive from New York City. Um, and so Buffalo is just an American football town. And so, yeah, that is definitely, um, you know, was my passion growing up as far as a sport goes. Um, and really everybody's passion in Buffalo. <laughs> you can't be from Buffalo and not be a Buffalo Bills fan. I did go to a Buffalo Bills. They were playing um, the, the Jets. I went to watch that one several years back. So, yeah, I have been to see them as my claim to fame on that one. Nice, nice. And they won. They won. So, yeah, you'll be pleased to know that. Nice. That's good to know. <laughs> we played last night. We did not do well last night. But, uh, yeah, everything's, you know, we don't usually have American football on Tuesday nights. That was very rare. Um, but they're having to sh obviously do a lot of shuffling of the schedule due to um, coronavirus. So it was quite odd to have a game on Tuesday night, but it was a, a nice change during the week. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So what, what did make you get into professional sport then? So how, how did that, what was the first step into it? Yeah, I, I moved to Arizona on a complete whim. I had no job. I had, didn't know anybody out here um, and just moved on a total whim because the weather was nice. And I was reading an article in Sports Illustrated um, about a guy named Nomar Garcia Parra. And Nomar, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Nomar after, uh, after reading this article, but at the time I didn't know him, but I was a fan of him because he was a Boston Red Sox player. And, and uh, the Red Sox were my favorite baseball team. So I read an article about Nomar and that he trained at a facility called Athletes Performance here in Arizona. Um, and Athletes Performance is now known as Exos and um, it's owned by a man named Mark Verstegen. And so um, I just cold called Mark and started volunteering at Athletes Performance a few days a week. And, um, you know, a few days a week of volunteering turned into calling if someone was injured or needed anything and um, that eventually turned into a full-time job over the course of about six months and so once I started working at Athletes Performance um, that's really where I started working with professional athletes in the off season um, and really where my opportunities to work in season whether it be with the U.S. Men's National Team um, back in 2011 I had a little stint with them and, um, and then with the LA Dodgers um, that's really sort of where um, those opportunities came up was was from working at athletes performance and so you know the professional sport thing kind of kind of snowballed from there. So how experienced were you then when you contacted Mark and, and were trying to get in there how, how, how much experience did you have at that point? Not much you know I think I was 24 years old um, I had gone to undergraduate school I'd gone to graduate school and um yeah, really didn't have any experience. I don't really know why he hired me. You know, I, I will, he, he tells a story that I'll, I'll share. As we were speaking, um, he asked me what I wanted to do, like my long-term goals. And I said, I, I said, I don't know what I want to do, but I know I want to be really great at whatever it is I do. And he said that answer, he really liked that answer. And, and while I may not have had a ton of experience at the time, athlete performance, I mean, this is back in 2001, so almost 20 years ago, uh, which shows my age, but um, yeah, almost 20 years ago. And so I think they were a young company, you know, Mark at the time, I think was also 34, 35 years old. So it's not like any of us that were there were super old or super experienced. And um, so I think it was, he just decided to take a chance. He knew, even though I didn't have experience, I was going to grow into maybe what he was hoping um, and that I had a passion and a drive and he knew that he could definitely work with passion and drive and he could upscale whatever skills that I was missing from a performance standpoint. Um, so yeah, I think he definitely took a chance, lucky for me. <laughs> what was their structure there in terms of physical therapy? Like how, how well built up was that? 
Uh, they weren't. I was I was Mark's first physical therapist at Athletes Performance, and so I built the um, PT program with everybody there um, as we grew, as we grew in locations, as we grew in different populations, as we started to work in military and corporate wellness um, and education, and um, you know, grew our different facilities. Um, I was able to really kind of grow into a manager and into a leadership position within athletes performance. And so it was definitely something that uh, I didn't have experience with at the time. And, you know, luckily I was with a young growing company and we all sort of just grew together and figured it out together. But yeah, I think I was, I was his seventh employee overall, his first physical therapist. And now, you know, if you know Exos, you know, it's uh, worldwide monstrosity. So really, really grateful for my time there. It was truly one of the best periods of my life that was just um, incredible and really just set the tone for everything I've been able to do in, in my career and, and, and personally and professionally. And so I owe, I owe Mark Verstegen uh, quite a bit of gratitude. Yeah, no, that's an amazing story then if you were the first physio on board. So I, was, I visited Exos last, uh, last spring like you say, an incredible facility. How does it compare to what it was like then? What was the, was it on the same site or what was it like? Yeah, no, we, we originally had a site in Tempe, Arizona. So not far from the airport and we were on the campus of ASU and, um, anybody who worked at that original facility, that was, uh, that was such a special facility. You know, Mark was able to design it, um, just really, Perfectly. Not that the other facilities aren't aren't perfect, but I think that place just holds, uh, you know, someplace special in all of our hearts that that started off in that facility. Um, you know, the size was massive. In 2001, there were no training facilities like that. I mean, now, you know, 19 years later, there's there's amazing facilities throughout the country, but I really think that facility and the way Mark, right down to the color of the paint on different sides of the house, we had a recovery side of the house, a work side of the house. We had um, a huge huge, massive pool and hot tubs, cold tubs, underwater treadmills, like things that just weren't present in performance training facilities 20 years ago. And so, I, you know, I really feel like that facility set the bar for what people have now. Um, but, you know, 19 years ago, that it just didn't exist. It was really an incredible facility. Yeah, no, that is, that is amazing. And what kind of athletes were you working with there then? Uh, we had um, mostly baseball, American football, um, um, and some hockey, not as much basketball. Basketball players notoriously are, are they don't like to come in the gym. They just like to play basketball. Um, <laughs> and so mostly baseball and American football. And then we had several golfers and we had several, several tennis players as well. Um, and yeah, we just kind of, kind of grew organically from there. I mean, Mark really set the vision um, and, and went after it. So lots of, lots of different Athletes, you know, eventually we got some race car drivers and eventually we started working with, with football um, or, you know, or as we say, soccer and, uh, you know, kind of grew from there, especially once we started to expand facilities, we opened a facility in LA and the um, LA Galaxy shared a facility. So we started working there and, um, you know, Mark had the opportunity, I believe that's where Mark met Jürgen Klinsmann. And then when Jürgen um, got the job with the German national team, brought athletes performance with Jurgen and that's how I met Jurgen was obviously through our, through that connection. Um, and so then when Jurgen got the job with the U S men's team, you know, again, brought athletes performance with, with him. And so, uh, definitely had a longstanding relationship with Jurgen over the years. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And how did you find it in terms of working with those variety of athletes? So looking after a tennis player, how, how difficult was that to manage that as well as a baseballer? Yeah, you know, I was a horrible athlete growing up. Um, <laughs> I was not good. I did um, synchronized swimming, which people, um, you know, not a common sport in the U.S., that is for sure. Um, and so because I grew up in the pool, I just didn't develop any fast twitch muscle fibers. Like I have no eye hand coordination, <laughs> I have no power. Like I'm not really a great athlete, um, admittedly. Uh, but I worked really, really hard. I learned early on that the key to coaching was to be able to perform three reps to one side. So that was always my goal was to be able to demonstrate with the bar 
I didn't, I knew I didn't have to move a lot of weight, but I just had to be able to move the bar and not look like I was, uh, you know, going to get pinned by that. And I had to do three reps to one side of every movement. So I worked really, really hard at that. Um, and so I just really became a student of the sport that I was working with. And I, you know, again, 20 years ago, film wasn't something that was readily available. I mean, now everybody can, you know, shoot everything on their cell phone, but, you know, we'd set up the video cameras or, or if I had footage of the player playing their sport, I would just sit down with the athlete. I would ask a million questions. Um, you know, you would think they would get annoyed, but they loved it, they, right? They love talking about their sport and their, their technique and why they do something. And so, I just really became a student of every sport I worked with, read books on hitting, read books on pitching um, that the guys would recommend me and, you know, just, just watch film with them and ask questions. And um, yeah, I just was a student, was a student in the sport because I really didn't play, you know, I played football growing up, but um, like I was like most improved player, you know, like I, I was not a good athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, do you have a particular love into, I know you're uh, an American football fan, but do you have a particular sport that you like managing better than others? Athletes? You know, I, I, I mean, I like all sports. I, I just like working with athletes in general and working with high performers who, you know, have a set of goals that they want to uh, attain. So generally I, I just like that. But um, as far as sports go, you know, baseball is my love. Um, I know that's not one of, uh, you know, the UK's national pastimes, but, um, you know, here in, in the US, it's definitely a pastime for sure. And um, yeah, I, I love the biomechanics to it. It's a nitpicky sport, right? When you hit the ball two out of 10 times, you, you probably don't make the major leagues. If you hit the ball three out of 10 times your whole career, you might be a Hall of Famer, right? So it's, it's you know, and it's a game of inches. You know, if you throw the ball here, it's a strike. If you throw the ball here, it's a ball. Um, and so it's so particular and it's so nuanced. Um, and it's really like an active game of chess. And so um, the players kind of have that similar mindset too of, of um, really just sort of that fine tuning um, of certain things. And so I've always really kind of enjoyed that. But I also really love American football too. And so, you know, most of my clients right now are American football players. And, um, you know, they're just fun to work with. They're, they're gritty, they're tough. Um, and yeah, they go hard. It's just a totally different sport. So those are, are probably my two favorite. And so how did you go from being athletes performance to, to being embedded with the Dodgers? So we, um, well, the LA Dodgers approached Athletes Performance back in maybe 2007 uh, to do some work with them as a whole, as an organization to sort of help with injury prevention and injury reduction, things that they were dealing with. Um, and so in 2008, it kind of became my account for a lack of a better word to sort of manage. Um, and so what started off as spring training and you know when they would come into town to play the diamondbacks here in arizona um and a, you know a couple trips to the minor leagues sort of grew into oh why don't you come hang out in all of september when the rosters get expanded and then why don't you come for all of spring training and then why don't you come for half the games and then before you knew it it was 120 games a year you know baseball plays 162 games a year which is insane um and so you know before you knew it i was 120 games and then um then it eventually they offered me um well actually i took a step back in 2011 um Athletes Performance was offering me a vice president job, and I knew that the Dodgers wanted more of my time, too. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to do both of those positions well. Um, and so I took a step back from the Dodgers and just kind of consulted with them on some spinal um, when I say spinal injuries, I don't mean like spinal cord injuries. I just mean like back pain, neck pain, those sorts of things. So stayed on a, as a consultant that year, but really shift my focus back to athletes' performance um, in that role. And then um, at the end of 2011, the Dodgers approached me again about becoming the head athletic trainer. Um, and you know, by that time, I had settled into my role as VP with athletes' performance, and you know, sat down and talked to Mark about it. And I didn't want to leave athletes' performance. I, you know, that was really my love. And 
Mark was like, at the same time, this is an incredible opportunity. Like you can't say no to that. And so, you know, we really worked it out where I was able to maintain my role with athletes performance. Uh, things had really sort of settled down and, and we had a lot of great people in place that could manage the day-to-day -day stuff while I continued to manage um, the physical therapy department um, from a little bit more um, of a 50,000 foot view, so to speak, and could really focus my day-to-day -day attentions back onto the Dodgers. And so, um, so yeah, it was just sort of a role that grew very organically over time and just was really grateful that Mark and um, the GM for the Dodgers at the time, Ned Coletti and Stan Conti, who was VP of medical services, um, everybody was just really willing to work with me to, to make it work, which was really, really amazing. Um, and so, you know, did that for a couple of years. Um, and shockingly, having those two jobs at the same time is probably not the brightest thing to do for your general health. Uh, <laughs> and so I kind of quit everything um, after a few years and uh, thought I was committing career suicide. I thought, well, I'm done. I'm like leaving two of the most coveted positions in our country. Like I'll never have a job again in sport performance or athletic training. Um, and, you know, luckily that wasn't the case, but uh, yeah, that's kind of what, <laughs> what transpired over time. So but yeah, you, I'm grateful for that time. It was, it was really incredible. Well, it sounds it, but how do you manage them? So I guess you're now managing all of those baseball games then. So 160 odd games. How do you, how does that physically, how do you do it? Yeah, um, you know, you could argue probably not very well. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, you're on the road, you know, you're 10 days at home, 10 days on the road, um, you know, and even back in 2012, right, you start thinking about how much technology has really increased even over the last five years. It's funny, I, you know, I posted a picture, you know, memories kind of come up on Facebook and there was a picture of us winning the NLCS and, you know, I had a shame, champagne bottle, um, and was drenched in champagne, right? And there was like 20 likes on it, right? And like now, like if someone posted a picture like that, there would be like thousands of likes, right? Like social media wasn't even that big back then when I was there, thank God, because I think that would have made that position a lot more difficult. Um, and so, you know, the reason me even saying that was because even technology wasn't, it's not like we were doing tons of FaceTime or Zooms back then. And so it was a lot of cell phone meetings. It was a lot of being up super early, dealing with athletes performance stuff in the morning before I went to the ballpark. I'd go to the ballpark at around 1130 or 12. I'd be at the ballpark till midnight. Um, you know, during batting practice, we would have other athletic trainers on the Field. So I'd kind of have another hour during the day that I could kind of jump back into athletes performance stuff. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, 100 and, 110, 115 hour work weeks every week for two and a half years. And um, yeah, it was very, very difficult. <laughs> Not a good social life, I think, I'm taking it in that period. No. Yes, there was no social life <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> So, I mean, that's incredible to hear that. How big was the squad you had? And also how big was the medical team there? Yeah, we, on a baseball team, we have 25, there's 25 man roster and then there's a 40 man roster. So the additional 15 guys are not with you on a day-to-day -day basis. They're typically um, at another their location in what we call AAA, which is like the minor leagues. Um, and so, yeah, I would manage basically that 40 man roster. Luckily the way our medical team was set up, we had a lot of people. Um, Typically, the head athletic trainer would be fully responsible for 160 players throughout six to seven minor league teams. But luckily, the way we were set up, um, Stan Conti, who was our vice president of medical services, he really oversaw all of the minor leagues. He oversaw all the minor league trainers. He oversaw the draft, um, which was great. So really for me and my position, I could just focus on our 40 man roster and really those 25 guys that, was, that were with us on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we had two other athletic trainers. We had um, one or two strength coaches, depending on what year it was. We had a massage therapist who was also an acupuncturist. So um, we, we had quite a large staff, which, which was fantastic. We definitely um, had a lot of people, which, which was nice. And some really, really talented people and, and people that complemented each other for sure. Everybody kind of brought a different skill set to the table, which was great. And in terms of being a female in that environment, were there any, ever any issues with that? 
You know, um, depends on how you want to define issues. Um, I never really had any major issues whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I think in order to, you can't demand respect, right? I think in order to get respect, you have to give respect. And I was very respectful of the player space. You know, I didn't hang out in their locker room. Um, I went in there, I did what I needed to do and I got out. And I think as a result, they respected the athletic training room and the weight room where I mostly was. Um, you know, I took the time to get to know their wives. I took the time to get to know their families. So everybody, right, I knew if people at home were comfortable, then their life was gonna be easier, right? So I really kind of took the time to make sure that I had good relationships with their wives. Um, and, um, you know, just was professional. I mean, I think at the end of the day, players are super simple. Um, if you can help them achieve their goals, they don't care what gender you are, they don't care what color hair you have, they don't care what color skin you have. Um, you know, if you can help them achieve their goals, they're all in. And, and I think I, I got some early success with some key veteran players early on that sort of vouched and said, okay, she's okay. Um, and I, you know, once they figured out they could swear in front of me and I didn't care, um, then that was helpful too, right? Like they realized they didn't have to change who they were. Um, and I think for me, I just really took the approach. I, I can't expect 40, you know, 25 men and, you know, another 15 or 20 coaches to change because I walked in their room. Um, that's an unrealistic expectation. I think I took the approach of, hey, I'm in their space. I need to be the one that adjusts where I am. If I'm uncomfortable to get up and, and walk out of the conversation or leave the conversation, like I can't expect these these guys to change who they are and change their cultural dynamic of a hundred years just because I'm in the room. I, I just don't think that that's a, a realistic expectation, and um, I don't think that's a fair expectation. And so, um, so yeah, I just kind of took that approach that I'm in their space, and and I think that was helpful for for the players and and for the coaches too. I think the coaches were a little bit more difficult, not because that they didn't want me there. It's just, again, culturally, they weren't used to having females in the locker room. And so, you know, the players were used to having females in college or in high school, potentially, but the coaches, it was completely foreign to them. So again, I didn't, I didn't take it personal. It wasn't about me. It was about a cultural change in a sport that had been around for a hundred years prior to me. And I just couldn't take it personal. And so um, I think because I didn't, I really didn't have any major issues. Um, and, you know, guys were, guys were super, super cool and super, super respectful. And uh, we ended up just all having a great relationship and, and just having some, some really great times and great memories. I mean, those are some of really the best times in my career. Did you feel that you did have to justify or prove yourself more than maybe a male who'd got into that role and with management? Um, Yes and no. I mean, you know, I think it's funny because during that time, I often was the only female in the room for, you know, not even just with the Dodgers, but even at athletes performance. I mean, I was the only, you know, we didn't have another female coach or, or female physical therapist in the beginning, or when I would go to, to meetings, I was always often the only female in the room. And so being the only female in that organization initially just wasn't anything different for me. I was like, oh, you know, another day at the office, me and a whole bunch of men. Um, so it, it wasn't like it was different because really the strength and conditioning field and performance field even 20 years ago, just there just wasn't a lot of women, let alone w women in position of leaderships that might be um, that might be at board meetings or might be a different kind of meeting. So it wasn't really any different. And so I think I never felt like I had to prove myself because I was a female, I think I just felt like I had to prove myself because that's who I am as a type A personality and, and, and as someone who wants to be really, really great at what they do um, and, and has a passion for what they do. That's why I wanted to prove myself. Um, but, you know, to say I needed to prove myself more because I was a female, I guess I never really felt that way. Um, I was also really lucky to have a lot of really positive 
female role models growing up in my family. I'm, you know, come from an Italian family. So Italian women are notoriously very, very strong, very, very opinionated. Um, and, you know, even in grad school, you know, I went to the University of North Carolina, which is just one of the, the best sports medicine programs in our country. And, you know, there were, oh, see, I knew we weren't going to get through, uh, through our interview without Richard barking. Um, so sorry. <laughs> There's a truck outside that he clearly can go up against. Um, but yeah, so there were some really amazing females at the University of North Carolina too that were athletic trainers and in sports medicine positions. And so again, I think I just always saw that, um, or I just had some really, really great female examples in my world. So I never really thought like, oh, I've got to do something different because because I'm a female. You know what? I know a lot of women don't have that and. Um, I naively didn't realize that until sort of this whole first female thing kind of came about. And so, you know, now I really try to be that for other people. If women reach out to me, I'm, I'm always keeping in touch with young women. And because uh, I, you know, I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was to have such a strong representation of um, female leadership and, and female strength sort of within my life, both personally and professionally. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, again, I think I just felt like I had to prove myself because that's who I am and, and that's what I want to do, but not necessarily because of, of being a female. Yeah, no, that's good. And what's the state in terms of females in, in that industry now? Have you, is there more people involved? There, there are definitely more. Um, the LA Lakers, who just won the NBA championship, they have a female head athletic trainer, which is really exciting. Um, and um, oh, we have a whole dog chorus happening now in the neighborhood. Hey, uh uh. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a f definitely more women within the minor leagues um, within baseball. There's definitely more women um, within basketball, within football, within the collegiate setting. So it's definitely coming up um, more and more, which is which is wonderful and and really great to see. No, definitely no, it's, it's really good. So in terms of then setting up structure and function education, where where did that come from? Yeah, um, it. It really came out of, you know, after I um, left the U.S. men's national team, I started teaching dry needling um, for another company. And over time, I just had the opportunity to start my own education company. And I thought, you know, anytime you have the opportunity to work for yourself, it's definitely scary. Um, but I just thought, you know, now is the time. And so I decided to start my own education company and um, named it Structure and Function because uh, I really feel like those things go together. And I didn't want to name my company after myself, but it helped that the initials were the same. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I decided to, to start that education company. And we started with dry needling um, because that's what I had been teaching. Um, but I knew that that was going to quickly grow. And so that was four years ago. We just had our four year anniversary in September. And uh, this year is really, well, last year, I should say, we started kind of getting more into our bridging the gap from rehab to performance type stuff. My book came out in 2018 with that same title, Bridging the Gap from Rehab to Performance. And I knew that the book was never the be all and end all of what I wanted to talk about with that topic. It was really more of the foundation and that it was going to be a living, breathing concept and that I wanted to be able to do either online education or in-person education, building off of the book versus the book being the culmination of it all, which is probably kind of backwards from the way most people <laughs> use or write their books. But um, so yeah, so now um, some positives that have come out of this COVID and quarantine time, you know, we were working on an online education platform that, you know, when you don't have to do something, um, it just sort of takes, uh, takes a back seat, if you will. And so um, once quarantine started and we realized we weren't gonna be doing in-person courses for a while, um, we jumped into the online thing head first and really have been able to put a lot of um, advanced dry needling things. So we don't teach you how to, how to dry needle um, or, uh, you know, 
you guys, we use dry needling a little bit different. Um, it's probably more akin to Western medical acupuncture in the UK. We can't use the word acupuncture in here, to, um, uh, you know, in the US without being an acupuncturist. And so we really um, focus more on dry needling, um, which is just a little bit different. And um, so we don't teach you how to dry needle online, but we do talk about advanced physiology and advanced things like that. And then we also put, um, I'm putting one by one all the chapters of my book into an online format. So every chapter is kind of turning into a two to four hour course, um, which is great. And so, yeah, um, like I said, it's kind of started out in the dry needling space and now we're moving more into the bridging the gap space. And um, we just published our first online course in nutrition with a friend of mine who's a registered dietitian. So really kind of, again, just going with that philosophy of inclusion, that philosophy of bridging the gap from rehab to performance and really what does that mean clinically, what does that mean, um, you know, in a real life topic, everything from pain management to, um, you know, acceleration and, and multi-directional speed and, and load parameters and sort of all of that stuff. And, and how do we really take an athlete from table to field? So, um, yeah, it's been a really fun, exciting four years, obviously a lot of work. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's been good. You know, I still have a concierge practice, so I definitely still treat patients weekly. Um, but it's been really fun to be able to um, educate and reach more people because then it just kind of becomes exponential, you know, however many clinicians that you're sort of um, touching and educating and working with on a daily basis and then how many patients they get to have. So um, it's kind of been fun to kind of see that ripple effect um, throughout the world, which has been, which has been really exciting. No, it is. That's, that sounds amazing. So it's difficult to answer at the moment, but what is your vision for, for where that's going to go? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I would have had a much different answer seven months ago, <laughs> as I'm sure every business owner would. Uh, but yeah, you know, we're I love in-person teaching. It, it's, it really is my passion. I love being with people and I love... Um, I love coaching people and, and love coaching athletes. I love coaching clinicians. I love coaching um, in a lot of different ways. You know, unfortunately, I think the digital space is really where we're all going to be living for a while. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we'll expand our digital platform much more now than I thought we would seven months ago. So, you know, like every business in the world, we have had to shift our priorities and, and shift our vision. Um, but I think our mission hasn't changed, um, which is to really sort of disrupt um, not only the, the healthcare space, but the performance space, right? And really sort of bridge that gap between healthcare and performance and, and realize that wellness um, doesn't end when you are injured and it's not like you are injured and unwell and then you become well right like it's it's this continuum that you are somewhere on that line of wellness um and how do we really kind of bridge that whether we're talking about sport performance um from a, a rehab to a performance standpoint or, or just from a daily high performance life of someone who maybe doesn't have the healthiest lifestyle, but now they, they want to live a more healthy, well-rounded lifestyle. How do we get people to move better? How do we get people to live better? Um, and so, yeah, I think that mission hasn't changed, even though maybe our vision has, has had to pivot like, every, like everybody's kind of had to pivot over the last few months. Yeah, definitely. And how do you feel like you keep up to date with, with what is going on? There's so many different areas of sports science and medicine that are coming up all the time. How do you keep up to date? Yeah, it's near impossible. You know, I'm glad I'm at the tail end of my career because um, it is getting really difficult to keep track of the technology that is coming about um, to keep track of all the different Thing. So, you know, I try to keep things really simple. I have a very critical eye. Um, I always go back to structure and function, right? I go back to my anatomy and I go back to physiology and I always go back to human movement. And if it's something that can enhance those, those, that thing of, of human movement and, of, and then, and of wellness, great, you know, I'll take a look at it. 
you know, at the same time, things are coming and going so quickly. I try not to get distracted by the shiny object. It's hard not to um, in 2020. There, there's so many different things. And especially now that everybody's kind of working more in a digital age. I mean, the technology that is coming out is, is just overwhelming. And so, you know, I keep things simple. Um, I use a lot of pen and paper. Um, I use a lot of just straight, easy video. I don't do a ton of crazy um, uh, uh, you know, crazy stuff. I think sometimes people can gather so much data, um, and that they don't really know what to do with that data. So in my opinion, there's just no point in gathering tons of data if you don't know what you're really going to do with it. Um, and so, yeah, I try to keep things simple and I try to see what's rooted in anatomy and I try to see what's rooted in physiology. And if, and if I can do that, right, like my philosophy as a clinician is to restore and maintain the homeostatic balance of my patient. Like that's my philosophy. And so whether that's biomechanical, biochemical, biopsychosocial, whatever that may be, that's my philosophy. And if it can enhance my philosophy, great. If it, if it can't enhance my philosophy, that's okay too. But my philosophy is, is unwavering and I'm rooted within it. And I think people can get distracted by the shiny tool when they don't really have a solid philosophy of treatment. And so I find, especially younger clinicians, that they confuse philosophy with tools. And so they're like, oh yeah, I like to use a lot of dry needling or, oh yeah, I like to use a lot of, um, um, you know, I like to use a lot of, um, you know, whatever it may be. And um, yeah, I think that's when people start to kind of spin and chase the next shiny object. When you have a philosophy of treatment, um, you, won't, you won't get distracted by those things. They either fit within your philosophy and support what you're trying to do or they don't. No, I think that's really good. And like, there's a lot of different people will have different philosophies out there. Have you got any, what, what bit of advice would you give for someone who, who wants to get into being a physio and athletic trainer? What one piece of advice would you say about developing your own philosophy um, or anything really? Yeah. You know, philosophy takes time to develop. Um, and I challenge, I teach at the university, one of the universities as well here um, in the doctoral program. And I, I start with that question really early on with my doctoral students that I, that I work with um, and really get them thinking that way. I think a lot of times when people can't express their philosophy, it's just because they've never been asked to do that before. And so if you haven't spent like anything, if you haven't spent time, hey, Sorry. <laughs> um, it's like anything. If you haven't spent time thinking about it, um, then, you know, you probably don't know. So I guess anybody that I um, tend to work with um, from that standpoint, I just simply ask them to think about and express their philosophy and, and get them thinking that way. And, and often tell them, like, you probably can't answer that question right now. That's okay. Um, but, you know, in a year or two, hopefully you can kind of formulate that. So I just try to get younger clinicians thinking that way really quickly. Um, and, yeah, instead of just checking off a bunch of boxes and getting a bunch of letters after their name. Yeah, no, I think it's a really interesting area, really. And what one piece of advice, it may fall into the philosophy um, area, but what one piece of advice would you give to a, a physio who is, say, right, not sure exactly where they want to go, but, how would you suggest that they approach their career? Yeah, you know, I, I often will, will tell young clinicians um, to get a lot of experience. I think, you know, everybody kind of, not everybody, but, but especially some young women or even young men, they'll say, you know, I want to do what you did, or I, I want to work in sport, or I want to work in some of the positions that you've had. And I was telling, I didn't know, I mean, right, we started that conversation. I didn't know I was going to work in professional sport. That was never my goal. Um, and I think I always try to remind kids too, like our kids, younger, I try to remind younger clinicians and younger professionals, you know, I graduated college a long time ago. Um, it took me 13, no, it took me 12 years before I had my first job with a professional sport organization. So I always tell younger professionals, remove that expectation of you're gonna graduate from school and get a job with a professional organization and right out of the gate, like that's probably not gonna be your first job. If it is, congratulations, that's wonderful, but 
took me 12 years to get my first job with a professional organization. Remove that expectation that it's your first job out of practice. My first job out of, out of school was um, in a super busy outpatient orthopedic clinic. I saw 30 to 40 people per day. Um, and even though that's not necessarily where I wanted to spend my career, I learned a ton. I learned time management. I learned how to manage other people. I had to manage techs. I had to manage physio assistants. Um, I had to, I saw a lot of different people from a lot of different socioeconomic backgrounds um, and learned how to communicate with people that were different from me. Um, and so I learned a lot of really valuable lessons from working in that facility that I think served me well moving forward. And so I try to tell them to just A, realize that you're not going to get that grand position right when you leave school. Um, so remove that expectation. B, it's sometimes better to know what you don't want to do versus what you want to do. So many younger professionals say to me, well, I don't really know what I want to, you know, what I want to do. That's okay. You don't have to know. But if you know what you don't want to do, then you can make appropriate steps. When I, when I moved out to Arizona, um, I knew I didn't want to work in outpatient orthopedics anymore. I had done it for a couple of years. Um, and that was it. I, I got what I needed from that space and I was ready to move on to something different. I didn't know what that space was, but it would have been very easy to be distracted by the extra 20 or $25,000 at the time that an outpatient orthopedic clinic was offering me. Um, because, you know, when you're a, a younger professional, that seems like a ton of money. And now I'm not saying it's not a ton of money, but in the grand scheme of my life, if I would have taken that job versus taking a chance with Mark Verstegen, my life would have been very, very different, right? All over kind of the short-term salary versus what could have potentially been the long-term benefits of taking a chance in this space um, of sport performance that, that really hadn't been done back in 2001. And, and, and I took a chance and, and I think it worked out rather, rather well for me. Um, Right. But it would have been really easy to have been distracted and say, okay, this place is offering some more money. I'm going to do that right now because I'm in a lot of debt from school and, and whatever. But it was an outpatient orthopedic position. And I thought, you don't know what you want to do, but you know what you don't want to do. You don't want to work in outpatient orthopedics. Don't get distracted by the shininess of whatever they're offering. Stay on course. And sometimes staying on course is just not going that way. And so that's all I did was I just didn't go the way I knew I didn't want to go, even though I didn't know where I was going. Hopefully that makes sense. No, it definitely does. Yeah. So you're kind of following your, you've got instinct in a lot of respect, aren't you? In terms of, you know, where you don't want to go. Sometimes you may have a particular drive to go and work with someone. I mean, how well known was Mark at that point? Not very. <laughs> I mean, he had one facility, uh, you know, he had, he'd worked with, uh, you know, couple dozen amazing athletes, which was great. And they were all touting his praise, but you know, um, like I said, he was a 30, 33, 34 year old kid <laughs> starting a, starting a business. And so, um, yeah, it was a huge chance and, and it, it could have flopped, right. It could have gone the wrong direction. Um, and, and, you know, I would have dealt with that then, but I just thought, you know, this has the potential to be something special and it's something I, I really want to be involved with. Um, you know, and I think that's the other thing too. Again, people just think, if you remember back to how I started my story, I mean, I volunteered for Mark from April to September. I mean, I volunteered my time to his facility to prove my worth for a good six months. Um, and I think that's another thing that, that kids think, oh, I'm going to come out, I'm going to get the, the most amazing job with the professional organization at at the perfect salary. Um, and it's like, no, no, you know, I worked for nothing for six months uh, because I wanted to be there and I wanted to learn. And I was gaining just as much as they were gaining uh, because I was learning how to integrate strength and conditioning and, and sport performance within, you know, my main skills of, of being a healthcare professional. And so you know, I certainly wasn't being fully altruistic. I was definitely uh, gaining experience and, and gaining things myself. But, but um, you know, you've, you've, got to, you've got to put that time in. And, and so I just try to encourage young professionals to do that. So how did you manage to live if you were volunteering there? Then how were you sustaining yourself? 
Um, I did have another job that I was working at part time in an outpatient orthopedic clinic. Um, but I was doing that uh, because, yeah, at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to make money. So I was working at, a, at an outpatient orthopedic clinic um, three days a week, and I was volunteering at, um, at Athletes Performance two days a week. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned about the outpatients because a good friend of mine who's going to be doing a podcast with us in a few weeks' time, who is physio at rugby and um, top level football teams. He said he doesn't even look at CVs if they've not worked in the NHS for at least two or three years. He just says that experience they get there is absolutely invaluable, all the different conditions that you see. And it's so important to have that kind of uh, grounding of, of, um, of knowledge and experience. Yeah, absolutely. I always tell people sports medicine is a specialty of orthopedics. And if you don't have a great foundation in orthopedics, then you're going to struggle in sports medicine. Um, and so, yeah, I, I agree with him. I think that that foundational experience and, and seeing just a lot of different core morbidities and, and all of those things serve you well um, over the course of your career, for sure. I mean, you know, it, it's easy to work with athletes. I mean, I work with 18 to 35 year old, really healthy men. I just have to stay out of their way. You know, I mean, I have a bigger chance of messing them up than I do of actually helping them. So I just try to support physiology. They're incredible humans. I just support their physiology. I try to take their 21 day injury and make it 19 or 18. Um, but, you know, let's face it, these are, they're incredible bodies. Um, you know, it's difficult to work with someone who's got multiple disease processes going on. They don't have resources. They don't, they don't have, um, um, you know, some of, the, some of those things that, that we, I take for granted now in my patient population. So I, I think it serves people well to, to have that more, broad, that more broad experience in order to be able to apply it um, to a specialty area. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. So the last podcast that I did with another um, physio and professional sport, he said he thought it was around 5% of quality physio skills the other 95 was being able to manage the patient, engage with them, get them to trust you, believe you, all of those things. What, what's your views on, on those numbers? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I always joked early in my career that, you know, we didn't take nearly enough psychology courses uh, in physio school in the U.S. Uh, because so much of it is trust. And, and people ask me that too. Like, how do you get some of these, you know, I work with some amazing clients and get to travel all over the country with them and, and do some pretty cool things. And, um, you know, people are like, gosh, you must be the best physio. And I'm not being self-deprecating at all. Like, I, I think I'm good at what I do. I don't think I'm the absolute best physio in the world. But I think my clients, I mean, one guy that I'm working with, I, you know, we've worked together on and off for 18 years. Um, and so, you know, you develop these relationships with people and you gain trust and you gain, um, um, you know, you, you become part of their family and they, and they look at you for, for a lot of different things beyond, you know, how can you help my ankle? Um, and so, yeah, I think that those intangibles uh, that you develop with your patients over time is, is really really incredible and, and oftentimes more than, okay, what's the biomechanical aspect of what I'm doing here? Um, you know, sometimes the biomechanics of it really are, are very, very small. <laughs> yeah, I think what you said about keeping it simple sounds like a good philosophy for, for everything really. I keep things so simple. People would probably be mortified if they saw my evaluation. They'd be like, really? That's all you do? Like, that's not very exciting, Sue. Uh, but yeah, I keep it super simple. You know, the biggest part of my evaluation is my subjective. You know, I, I talk to, I talk to my clients. I find out exactly what hurts, exactly what doesn't hurt. You know, what makes them worse, what makes them better. Um, you know, sometimes nobody's asked them some of these simple questions. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time, especially with a new client, you know, just, just talking and asking questions and kind of developing that, that relationship right out of the gate. But, you know, people ask me, what's, what's my best part of my evaluation? Um, it, it's easily my subjective for sure, which I know is not very exciting, but it's very, very true. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Honesty is always good. No, I just want to say a massive thank you for joining us today. It's been really, really interesting. And we definitely would like to have you part of the Physical Academy at some point. So hopefully in person at some point that we can get you over here and, and do some workshops. But otherwise, definitely some online uh, shared webinars and podcasts would be really, really good. 
That would be wonderful. I would love that. I really am looking forward to, to traveling more. I'm starting to travel a little bit within the U.S., um, but definitely looking forward to, to getting back over to, to the U.K. and uh, to other parts of the world as well. And so, yeah, that would, that would be lovely. Thank you so much for having me on today and, and for taking the time. I really appreciate it. No problem. Um, thank you to Richard for not being too much of a distraction as well. I am so sorry. He had a couple of spouts there that I just knew he wasn't going to be able to contain himself. No, no, he's good. <laughs> he's, he's all good. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll speak to you very soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Same to you. <laughs>